Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us for today's litigation update for M&A Council, the third and final webinar in our 2023 commercial litigation series. Uh, first things first, while I introduce myself and our speakers, please see the information slide that is on your screen. Uh, I'd like to draw your attention to the survey piece. We really value your feedback on our sessions here today, and so we encourage you to fill in the survey before you log out of the webinar. And uh, with that out of the way, my name is Gabrielle Sear. I am an associate with Baskin's Ottawa office, uh, and I practice predominantly in the area of commercial litigation, international arbitration, procurement, and white collar crime. That said, you're not really here to hear from me. You're here to learn, as am I. And so it is with great pleasure that I introduce your headliners for today. Uh, Jesse Harper is a partner in our Faskin Toronto office and a member of our litigation and dispute resolution group. Jesse maintains a broad dispute resolution practice, which includes all aspects of civil litigation and arbitration, uh, and a particular focus on complex commercial and corporate litigation matters. Jesse is routinely called on to provide strategic advice to clients at all stages of commercial disputes. And he understands the importance of blending the dispute resolution strategy with the overall business strategy of the company. Our second speaker, Vincent Serra-Lagana, is a partner in our Montreal office and a member of our litigation and dispute resolution group. He is very active in commercial and business litigation. He acts regularly in shareholder disputes, uh, transactional litigation, and corporate governance litigation. Uh, and he also acts for both corporations and their board of directors, as well as minority shareholders uh, in the context of oppression remedy disputes. Uh, Vincent also regularly publishes and presents on all of these topics. And third, final but not least, is Paul Bleichak, who is counsel for Faskin. He is based out of our office in Calgary and is a member of our corporate and commercial group. Paul's practice is focused on mergers and acquisitions, uh, joint ventures and project development, cross-border transactions, and private equity. Uh, Paul also regularly publishes on M&A issues, including with LexisNexis, uh, the M&A Lawyer, and the American Bar Association. And so we are very fortunate to have these gentlemen all to ourselves today, uh, who've taken time out of their frighteningly busy schedules to speak with us. Uh, and now, without further ado, I will pass the microphone to our first speaker, Jesse, who is going to talk to us about privilege and the transfer of ownership of privileged communications. And so Jesse is going to provide us with an update on a recent Ontario case dealing with this issue. Take it away, Jesse. Thanks, Gabrielle. Um, and uh, as you mentioned, I'm going to talk about uh, the Dente case, which is a recent case um, out of our Ontario courts. Um, it's privilege, and I, I know that privilege may not be the most uh, exciting topic to start off with, but it is a, a topic that um, when we get through the discussion, you'll see can have really significant impacts on uh, your role in a transaction and, and potential post-transaction litigation um, if the privilege isn't properly protected. Um, the, the impact of the Dente case will probably be most relevant to those uh, representing sellers in a transaction or assisting sellers in a transaction. Um, but we anticipate the impact will be seen uh, sort of across the market generally because it, there are some uh, discussions about potential additional clauses to be added to share purchase agreements. So even if you're on for the purchaser, uh, important development to know about. Uh, and the issue, if I can boil it down to, to a pretty succinct description, is really in the course of a transaction, suppose the sellers are using their company email. Suppose they're getting advice from their counsel at their company.ca email um, as they're preparing for the transaction. Um, transaction closes, post-closing, uh, those emails may stay on the company servers, end up in the hands of the new owner and the purchaser. Uh, and the question is, is, is who owns the privilege, who can maintain the privilege? Um, and, you know, can the purchaser, if they're in receipt of these emails, use the emails to advance a post-closing claim? So you can see very quickly that, uh, you know, if there's discussions in the workup of an SPA about whether you can give a certain rep and warranty or, you know, what needs to be included in a disclosure schedule, obviously you don't want those to end up in the hands of the purchasers. Uh, 
um, post-closing. And the the interesting development that we're focusing on in the Dente case is really that um, the court explored the possibility of uh, parties using terms in an SPA uh, to identify who owns and maintains the privilege post-closing. Now, I think it's an issue that's most clear um, when we get into the specific fact pattern. So as we uh, go over to the next slide, I just intend to spend a couple minutes talking about um, the facts that gave rise to the the issues in Dente. Um, so the issue was, you know, as I suggested, the sellers had sent uh, their pre-closing emails with their counsel from their company email address. It was a small, closely held company. I think they tended to be in the uh, habit of just using their company emails as their personal and professional emails and um, didn't really cause uh, they didn't really stop to think as to whether they should be using their company email. Um, their counsel on the transaction uh, had historically ad acted for the company, um, but had also acted for the shareholders on some personal matters, doing some estate planning and, and family law issues. Um, when it comes to the transaction itself, counsel was clearly representing the sellers. He was negotiating the SPA um, from the seller's pers perspective uh, with the purchasers, um, but it wasn't clear whether he was acting for the company. He took the position that he wasn't acting for the company and the company didn't need representation. Uh, the purchasers who wanted to make use of the documents that ultimately ended up in their hand um, took the position that he was for, for reasons that will hopefully become clear in a little bit. Um, after the transaction, there was a, the founder stayed on on a consulting basis. Um, relationship ultimately soured as it sometimes does. Uh, and then there's a whole wealth of litigation. The, the sellers were suing for the termination of the consulting relationship, um, as well as certain issues relating to the earnout under the SPA, um, and the company countersued on, on some transactional issues. Uh, and, you know, as they're going through the litigation, counsel for the sellers and the litigation, uh, sorry, counsel for the purchasers, so the, the new owners uh, is looking at documents and sees that they have these emails between the sellers and their counsel at the time of negotiating the SPA. Um, may want to make use of them depending what they say. Um, of course, you know, being uh, counsel aware of their obligations under the rules, didn't actually read them to the extent they could avoid it. Um, but brought, there was a motion before the court as to, you know, whether the sellers can restrict the their use of the uh, documents based on privilege or whether the sellers were able to, to use them um, because they ended up being transferred in the course of the transaction. Uh, and the primary question uh, the court will look at is, first, was this an issue of joint representation or were they acting only for the selling shareholders? Um, so taking each of those separately, the issue if if counsel's acting for both, if counsel's representing the sellers and the company in the transaction, the privilege issues get thorny, right? In, in that situation, there's a joint privilege held by both the sellers and the company. Um, when you act for two parties, the, the privilege cannot be uh, maintained as against the other party to the retainer. Um, so if there's a situation where there's a joint retainer, the sellers cannot claim privilege as against the company. And importantly, now post-transaction, the company is really, you know, the new owners or the, the counterparty in the transaction at the end of the day. Um, turning to the second scenario, if you're only acting for the sellers or if counsel's only acting for the sellers, there's not a joint privilege and that privilege is the sellers to hopefully maintain and keep. Um, when you're in that situation, acting just for the sellers, and I'm going to come back to the joint representation situation because that's where Dente said some interesting things. Um, but starting where somebody's acting only for the sellers or you know you may be the seller in a transaction dealing with counsel, um, yes, you maintain the privilege, but it still can get risky using uh, the company servers. Uh, if you don't take steps to purge the privileged information from the servers in the course of the transaction. Um, if you leave it on the company server post-transaction, there may be an argument and very much a finding that that constitutes a waiver of the privilege that uh, you held. Remember that you have to protect privilege. You can't just uh, disclose these documents to the open world. And, and the more carefree you are about it, the more there will be a, a risk of a finding that the privilege has been waived. Um, there's ways to avoid that, even when you're acting just for the sellers, right? Like the the gold standard is when you're entering into a 
potential negotiation and potential transaction, don't put those emails on the company server, right? Go and make a Gmail address, you know, jesse transaction at gmail.com or something, right? That way it's never on the company server. There's no argument that it was transferred in the course of the transaction. Uh, and the sell the purchasers never see the documents. Um, less uh less safe but also uh well recognized approach is um having a, a system where you are removing the privileged communications prior to the sale um i don't love that approach because uh, as we know closings can get a bit rushed clients have a lot of things going on uh you know are they actually going to take those steps and accurately take those steps to remove all the uh documents but you know that is an accepted approach and in the dente case the finding was ultimately that uh, the privilege remained with the sellers and the sellers at least tried to remove the privileged communications from the server. And so therefore there was no waiver of privilege and, and the uh, purchasers could not uh, review or rely on the documents. Um, but turning back to the situation where there is a joint privilege, where there's a finding that council has been acting for both uh, the sellers and the company, uh, you know, in the normal course, the sellers could not enforce that privilege as against the purchaser. Uh, the the right to the privilege of the company transfers with the transaction, assuming it's a share purchase transaction and not an asset uh, purchase agreement. And the new owners as the company are the owner of that privilege and the sellers are sort of out to lunch on actually protecting it. So what can be done? And this is really where um, one of the statements of Indente comes in and it suggests that uh, provisions can be put into a, a share purchase agreement that can assist in maintaining the privilege uh, even post-transaction. And what the court said in Dente uh, and the statement that's gotten a lot of attention is the statement in paragraph 61, which technically was in Oberter because as I said, the court found that there was no joint representation here, um, but it's a statement that builds on uh, a statement that was made much earlier in Alberta, and that really gives effect to a development that is coming out of the U.S. Uh, in relation to a Great Hill clauses. And I'll talk about what those are in a second. But paragraph 61 is really the nut of it. It says, um, where there is a joint representation, the owner can insert a clause in the share purchase agreement that would leave the former owner in sole possession of the privilege upon closing. And when they fail to do so, the prior owner cannot claim privilege over documents as against the new owner who now owns the documents. Um, so as I said, this is this is not a new concept to um, corporate transactions generally. It's just something that uh, we haven't seen a ton in Canada. Um, but given this case, question whether we're going to see a lot more of it. Um, it's, it's a development that is pretty strong in Delaware. And, and for those of you who are aware of Great Hill Clauses, uh, it will not be news to you, but uh, they're called Great Hill Clauses just because that's the first case that considered these types of uh, clauses in, in Delaware. Um, but, you know, we've seen them used in Canada fairly sparingly. Um, you now have a decision where if you don't use a clause in a situation where there is a joint representation and privileged documents may end up in the hands of the purchasers, um, you're really going to be behind the eight ball on trying to suggest um, that there was a privilege that was maintained if you don't have provisions in your SPA addressing it. Um, so stepping back, what is a Great Hill Clause? Like it's ultimately a... Um, matter of drafting, you'll see all sorts of different forms, but it's essentially a clause in the SPA that deals with what is going to happen to the privilege post transaction. Um, most often it's going to say that it's going to stay with the seller because it's the seller's privileged communications. Um, even if there was a joint privilege between the seller and the company, um, you know, there's really three key terms that you tend to see in gray hill clauses. Obviously there's a lot of room around the margins to, um, talk about other things that you could include, but it's really as easy as identifying the privileged communications and issue. So it's, you know, transactional communications as between the seller and their counsel at the time, um, addressing communications or sorry, addressing control over those communications, right? The fact that they're going to stay with the seller and also importantly, including a, uh, no use clause that prohibits the buyer from relying on the communications uh, in any post-closing dispute. Uh, 
Jesse, uh, I wonder if I could interrupt with a question, if that's allowed. Yes. Uh, I was just wondering, as I'm listening to you talk about these clauses, I wonder what's the purpose of the no use clause if the seller retains the privilege? Is the fact that they have the privilege not sufficient? Yeah, it's a good question. And the concern is really that you certainly the first two bullets on the of what a Great Hill Clause uh, entails um, covers the fact that the privilege stays with the seller, right? But even if the privilege stays with the seller, you're open to an argument that, you know, if you do nothing to actually protect it, if you still just leave them on the company servers, share them with third parties, etc., the privilege has been waived. So all well and good that you said that this joint privilege now retains with the sellers. But if you just put that out to the world and out to the new owners, um, you could face an argument that there's a waiver of that privilege. Uh, and you know, controlling a privilege that has been waived doesn't actually give you much power. Uh, so a clause, a no use clause, I think has been a development where um, courts in Delaware have stated that even if there is a waiver of the privilege, or even if there's an argument that there's been a waiver of the privilege, the purchasers have committed to not use the documents in any event. So if you're in post-closing uh, litigation, the owners can't or the, the new owners can't use them um, irrespective of any argument they make about whether you waive privilege after the, the closing of the transaction. Okay, great. Thanks for that. Um, and so what does that mean in terms of practical considerations for for people who can put into practice to ensure that they're properly protecting themselves against a loss of privilege in a transaction? Yeah, and I think there's a lot of things you can do. Um, I mean, turning your mind to these is a, a good first step. Like these issue these issues arise when counsel doesn't really stop and think, or the sellers don't really stop and think about, you know, how are we setting up our communications? Are we doing it in a way that may end up having the communications in the owner's hands post transaction? Um, and think about situations that make it a bit muddy, right? Like has counsel historically acted for the company? Uh, is counsel acting for the company on non-transaction matters? Um, are you know are your emails dealing with both transaction matters and day-to-day -day operations in a way that makes it hard when you look at a particular email to determine whether this is a transaction document or a day-to-day -day transact or day-to-day -day document? Um, but really, it comes down to making it clear who counsel is acting for, um, because as I said, if, if it's only for the sellers, you don't get into these issues with joint representation and you're not in a joint privilege um, situation. So on the, on the next slide, uh, I've put up some things that the court will typically look at to consider who counsel is acting for. And it's these things seem silly in hindsight, but remember that the court's in a tough position. They're looking at a uh, relationship and trying to recreate who um, who counsel was acting for in order to make a determination. So things like, you know, who's, is there a retainer agreement and who is it with, right? It should be with the sellers, not with the company. Um, and if you've historically acted for the company, consider a new retainer agreement with the sellers. Um, as I mentioned, is there commingling of advice? Um, something as simple, you know, the Dante case, they looked at who paid the bills. Was it the company or was it the selling shareholders. So make sure you're clear who your bills are going to and who's paying them. Um, and I think in-house counsel's involvement can get really interesting because technically, right, in-house is counsel to the company. Uh, so if there's an issue where a shareholder is getting advice on a potential transaction from their counsel, um, their transaction counsel, should in-house counsel be involved in that discussion? Should they be on the email um, should they be in any way subject to that uh, communication? So, um, and finally, you know, not every M&A transaction needs separate counsel for the company, but if it's a situation where the company is taking on some liability or, or has interests that may not be aligned with the selling shareholders, um, there may be appropriate to have uh, counsel for the company uh, separate from counsel for the shareholders. Thank you, Jesse, for that update. Uh, you've certainly given us a lot to think about. Um, I will hand it over now to our next speaker, Vincent, who will speak to us uh, about earnouts. Thank you, Gabrielle. So maybe before I get started, a quick word in French. Uh, la présentation va être en anglais pour les fins d'une présentation nationale. Évidemment, pour ceux qui sont sur la ligne, qui sont francophones, si vous avez des questions, vous, connaissez, vous avez mon adresse courriel à quelque part, n'hésitez pas, ça va me faire plaisir d'y répondre. Euh, 
Yeah, let's talk about earnouts. Apparently, my M and A friends and some studies say that they are on the rise, which raises the question for a litigator: what What is the potential consequence? What are the litigation angles or the litigation considerations that should be taken into account when exploring or using earnouts in an M and A transaction? So, the first point, of course, is determining what is an earnout. Uh, it is a contractual provision by which at least part of the purchase price is calculated by reference to the financial performance or a milestone of the target corporation or business over an agreed span of time after the closing. Uh, and a lot of the comments I will make apply to earnouts, uh, but they would also apply to a partial sale of share where, where the seller retains a minority position and then a buyout mechanism, an option or anything in the future allows for the completion of a total purchase by the acquirer. Um, some of my comments also apply to other purchase price adjustments. Uh, the earnout is typically structured as one or more contingent payments of a purchase price after closing, uh, which are payable, payable when certain targets are met, for instance, EBITDA or revenue. Uh, and the, the buyout is not paid if those targets are not met or paid partially depending on circumstances. Uh, next next slide, please. So the reasons for using an earnout, I, I've included some, there are many others. Uh, I guess the main one is we may not be able immediately to agree on the price and value of the target. There may be a lot of underlying uh, questions as to the future. Some of these questions may be specific to the target, growth potential, uh, poor results that are recent but not necessarily uh, projected in the future, a volatile market, the industry, the economy, et cetera. There's also, um, there's also the idea that an earnout can incentivize the seller to remain part of the management and grow the business and ensure some level of, transi of transition. So there's a lot of reasons to use uh, an earnout. But on my next slide, you will see a very cynical or pessimistic approach to earnouts. It doesn't come from me, it comes from the Delaware Chance Report, which says, in theory, the earnout solves the disagreement over value by requiring the buyer to pay more only if the business proves that it is worth more. But since value is frequent, frequently debatable and the causes of underperformance equally so, an earnout often converts today's disagreement over price into tomorrow's litigation over the outcome. And of course, um, as long as we're negotiating a transaction and trying to close a transaction, if we end up disagreeing and not reaching an agreement, well, then there's no deal. But if the disagreement happen, happens after, in the earnout period after closing, then that often leads uh, people like me getting involved in a the litigation. There's no, there's no way to essentially spin out of there. Um, and that's where litigation or disputes can happen. Um, so I, I tried to think of three angles or three perspectives that come out of the case law or of our litigation practice that are, are related to, to earn out. The first one is really, how, how are we going to calculate the earn out and how, how are we going to determine whether the earn out is payable or not? And that is uh, can can very easily lead to litigation. So it's the formula itself, it's the mechanism. Uh, then the second step, of course, the earnout will more often than not, and almost in all cases, uh, depend on the performance of the target after closing. Um, so the performance of the target is not an abstract concept. People will have to work to achieve it. The buyer, especially if it's a larger group, may have uh different objectives and may uh may have a big contribution to bring to whether or not the earnout will be reached even if the seller sticks around and ensures the transition so what is everyone's obligations and you have effort effort clauses that are included in earnouts you have covenants regarding the operations and those can also lead to litigation and finally on a more practical and strategic aspect if there is litigation over an earnout the reality is that you're not necessarily going to be paid now, even if you are right. Uh, if you have to go through the court system, if amounts, for instance, are held in escrow, it may be a while before you get paid and the, the person controlling the amount or controlling the earnout, more often than not, the company itself or the, the buyer may have a strategic advantage, which is important to consider before agreeing 
to and you are now the promise of something in the future which can force you to fight years and years to get it um so let's let, let's tackle the, my first angle which goes to formula and uh methodology the, the methodology cannot always perfectly reflect the considerations which have led the buyer and seller to determine the the purchase price in the first place so what you include and what you exclude as you're trying to project what's going to happen in the future can lead to a number of disputes what obviously is the key is to use a formula that sticks the closest to the valuation principles that both parties use going in to establish the purchase price itself uh for instance uh some air now that's only based on revenue may trigger an incentive to focus only on revenues if it's based on the EBITDA uh, it may be closer to valuation but it will depend on a case by case basis obviously but the formula has to be as close as possible to the valuation concerns that both parties and add in the same add in the first place assuming that they are the same there is a um a key case uh in Canada a good example of that in white side versus Celestica International it's an Ontario Court of Appeal case so Celestica a larger group acquires a company based out of Ottawa called Corsim it's they they build product for uh, aerospace and there is an earnout which is based on the Corsim business so the targets business earnings before interest amortizations and taxes so in this case it's the EBIT um the dispute arises when a large contract comes in a game changer um and th that contract was generated by the larger group Celestica but it's being performed at the site of the Corsim business in Ottawa and really by the former Corsim employees by by the Ottawa operations of Celestica which were purchased in the Corsim agreement so if we if we look at the clause and that's a lot of words on a slide but i think it's important to look at what what's being said so 2.5a is is the basis for the earnout calculation and it essentially says it's going to be the ebiat for different periods and it's going to be calculated by the purchaser in accordance with gap in a manner consistent with the accounting methods used by the purchaser in the preparation of its audited financial statements as adjusted and then it's as adjusted in accordance with section 2.5b 2.5c and 2.6 so the 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 principle or the statement here is that if it's a if it's the the business's um ebiat then it should be counted and then adjusted afterwards for certain additions and c provides for cases where um the where where the the Corsim IP is being used by Celestica but for other products elsewhere so the first judge interpreted C focused on C and said essentially this is not a Corsim contract this is not necessarily Corsim IP it's not generated by Corsim and the focus was on on the C addition uh with respect to whose IP it is and the first judge decided that the earnout was not owed based on this game changing contract and the court of appeal disagreed that's the next slide and said the earnout must be paid and the contract must be read as a whole the additional ip based earnout provision cannot be read as depriving the sellers from the benefit of products fabricated and sold from the ottawa core sim business so the focus was really on 2.5a on the principles because you cannot isolate provisions from one another and also crucial to that determination in interpreting contracts that may be ambiguous the previous conduct of the parties is relevant and for smaller contracts that were less material over the first 2 years post closing uh, some of the, some similar contracts were included in the earnout calculation so the buyer could not suddenly try to get out of it of the earnout by excluding this big this larger contract uh before we get to that actually the i i also have a, another example it's a war story which ended up settling for other reasons never became uh never became judiciarized but it's a good example of what can happen so large group buys a canadian company um it's a retail it's in the retail field and essentially 
at that point, there's a majority stake bought by the group, but the minority, the former owner retains a minority position. And it's agreed that after three years, that minority position will automatically be sold so that the majority, the, the group becomes a 100% shareholder. The calculation by which this is done, it's not technically a earnout because shares are being sold later on, but the calculation is simply five times or six times the EBITDA, the average EBITDA of the previous three years. And there is no uh, notion of normalizing or adjusting the EBITDA. There is no further valuation being per performed by anyone. It's a mere calculation. So what happens is that COVID happens. And what the company does at that time is that it starts selling a product that's completely completely different from its core core business, from what the group does, from what that the target did. And it does so because it's COVID and because a number of companies started selling different products that were COVID related. And the success is huge. The EBITDA is driven up by a number of times, but obviously all of that has nothing to do with the future of the business, its future ability to generate cash flows. So the parties in that case found themselves where the earnout would have been, or the, the buyout of the minority position would have been extremely high, but not necessarily tied to what had been purchased in the first place. And all of this because there was no room to adjust the EBITDA in any way, just said EBITDA, period. Um, one key, when, when it comes to calculating earnouts and applying the formulas, oftentimes, and almost in most cases, experts will be involved. The parties will say, we will ask KPMG, we will ask Deloitte, we will ask another accounting firm to proceed with the calculation. It's important to keep in mind, and there's recent case law out of Quebec specifically on that, that you, you want to make sure your expert is an expert or your expert is an arbitrator, but you have to be clear on what that expert is and what that accounting firm is. So if the accounting firm is an expert, the expert provides an answer as to a specific calculation or valuation, uh, and that, ex that, that report or that answer can be presented to a court eventually, but that doesn't settle everything. And if there are disputes over contractual interpretation, over facts, over some of the stuff I mentioned earlier, then you're, you're still going to have access to a court to determine that. And the expert will really be there to provide the court with valuation expertise or, or really a number. Uh, but you want to make sure that if that's what you want and you don't want more than that, uh, you, you draft appropriately, essentially. And it's important to say that whenever an accountant will make an earnout calculation, if you want that person to be an expert and not an arbitrator, you should say so and you should write so. The case law says that to determine whether an, a, an accountant's or an expert's determination is final and binding and really resolves everything, a few topics, a few criteria will be considered. First, there has to be, if there is a dispute and the accounting firm really acts like a judge in many ways, hears the parties out, listens to evidence, listens to witnesses, goes very far in that process, then it may be found, at least under Quebec case law, that the expert, whether it's an accountant or evaluator, was really acting as an arbitrator and making a final determination, a final and binding determination on, um, on the earnout in this case. If that's not what you want, if you want just a calculation and you want the ability to debate before the court or before a real arbitrator, then the drafting should be, uh, should, 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 the, the clause should be drafted accordingly. And the best way to do it is to say, we retain ABC to act, uh, to, to calculate the earnout, do it this way and that way. ABC will act as an expert and not as an arbitrator. Um, so effort clauses and the impact on operations. So, so as I mentioned earlier, it's one thing to establish a methodology and to make sure that the calculation reflects what you really want out of an earnout. Uh, the other thing is what do the parties are actually do to reach that objective? Um, and as part of, of the earnout clause, there may be some, some, level of effort provisions. So for instance, if the buyer must make all uh, all reasonable efforts or all efforts, all best efforts 
to reach the earn out, then that suggests that all stones must be turned in order to achieve that objective. And if there's decision making or governance or or um, maneuvers that are less than that, then you may face an issue uh, in terms of whether or not you you carried out your best efforts. If 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 the if the standard is instead all commercial reasonable effort, then there's a notion of reasonableness that's included in that, and you may not have to go as far. So there is a specific attention that needs to be uh, given to the effort level that's required by the parties in order to reach the earnout. And when a judge will consider it, words will mean something. So if it's all best efforts, and that was that's what Sutter Hill Management stands for, it's a, a court of appeal case in BC, you cannot ignore the all best part of this. It really suggests uh, a more stringent standard. If it's only reasonable efforts, then broader considerations will be given to what was commercially reasonable or not in pursuing the targets that would have led to the earnout. The, the key here is that once you've accepted an earnout as a seller, you don't control all aspects of whether or not that earnout will be reached. Paul, in his section on some key uh, cases, will will tackle covenants regarding operations, and you can find those as well in determining the conduct of parties in the pursuit of earnout targets. Uh, and finally. In Quebec for a long time, and now more than ever in common law provinces as well, there is always a duty and an obligation to act in good faith. And uh, a party actively trying to fall just under the target to avoid the payment of an earnout may fall short of that duty. Um, so, so you always have to keep in mind that sometimes, especially under Quebec case law, uh, the analysis of courts will go further than what's drafted black on white uh, in the SPA. My last topic and last slide, just a bit of a reminder, very practical, that court delay is at least in Quebec, and maybe my friends in the other provinces will have comments on that, but but determining whether you're entitled to an earnout is really, in, in most cases, a, determin a determination on the merits of the case. For instance, if there's a debate on the formula, if there's a debate on whether or not the parties acted reasonably, conducted all the best efforts, there's no, in most cases, short path to getting this determined. There will need a full trial. There will need, we will need to go through the full process. And that in Quebec can take two, three, four years. So when you accept an earnout or establish a earnout, the reality is that whoever's right or wrong, if there is a dispute, well, one of those parties will control the amount. The amount may be an escrow until a final judgment. Uh, and the delays are significant, which is why and that's another another conference for another day. But earnouts may be a place where arbitration is helpful in order to accelerate things and not uh, be tied up by the court process. Uh, before I pass, uh, I pass it on to Paul. One comment: um, This is an MA for litigators conference or a litigation for MA conference. Uh, very interestingly. And maybe that's the book club section of this conference. But recently, the Supreme Court of Canada issued a very interesting decision on this. It's two weeks ago in Ponce uh, versus Société d'Investissement Réaume, pertaining to the duty to inform um, in the context of MNA. So it's a must read. Uh, we are not commenting on it because uh, on behalf of a client, we are somewhat, we were involved and are somewhat still, still involved in that case. But uh, Ponce versus Société d'Investissement Réaume, a rare Supreme Court cases on the topics we are touching on today, and more specifically, the duty to inform in an M&A context. Uh, and on this, um, Paul? Or Gabrielle? Uh, either or. Thank you, uh, Vincent, for that uh, another thought-provoking discussion. Uh, Paul, I won't eat up much of your time. Uh, don't think you need another introduction. Uh, Paul is going to speak to us about ordinary clause, pardon me, ordinary course covenants and material adverse effect clauses. So uh, over to you, Paul. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, so yes, I'm going to discuss ordinary course covenants and MAE clauses. Um, 
And I'm discussing them together. Uh, they're very often discussed separately, <clears throat> but I think where we are now, um, after the recent case law in Canada, it's best to discuss them together. I'll, I'll, I'll go dive into that a little bit further. Uh, so to, pro to provide an overview of how I'll be tackling these fairly complicated clauses, uh, start with just discussing again why I think it's best for them to be touched on together, why they still remain very much separate clauses, which should always be appreciated. Uh, I'll then look closer at ordinary course covenants themselves uh, and then closer at MEE clauses themselves. Um, and so, you know, a reason, an, an extra reason for discussing these clauses together is anyone who touches M&A has heard of Fairstone, uh, the most significant uh, case on MAE clauses, also uh, ordinary course covenants, and then Cineplex, which uh, deals squarely with ordinary course covenants. Those decisions are now getting a year or two old, so I'll, I'll visit a couple of more recent cases out of Delaware on those clauses. But another reason to discuss these clauses together is as, as those decisions have sunk in and the market has really digested them in detail, we've realized that, uh, that there are several problematic issues that arise from them. Um, and so to sort of keep the discussion fresh, uh, you know, we'll be looking at some of those problematic issues uh, in greater detail as we move on. So what are ordinary course covenants and MEE clauses? An ordinary course covenant, as we all probably know, is an interim period undertaking by the seller to operate the target in the ordinary course of business during the interim period. Somewhat differently, an MAE clause, material adverse effect, uh, effect clause, is a representation by the seller that an event hasn't occurred that has had or could reasonably be expected to have a material adverse effect on the target. Why do they matter? Uh, they matter because they are amongst the most heavily negotiated uh, clauses uh, in M&A, particularly after the pandemic. And so that brings us back to why we should discuss them together. So they're very different in a sense. They're also very complicated in their own ways, but they overlap. They overlap in terms of the trigger events that can make both of them relevant. The shining example being the pandemic. The pandemic destabilized everything. It brought sharply into focus what the ordinary course of business might be. It also brought sharply into focus what a material adverse effect on a target company could be. So they have that similarity in common. Another similarity they have in common is that they both interact with other uh, multiple other clauses of an M&A agreement. They can both give rise to either pre-closing or post-closing disputes. That being said, uh, and both Fairstone and Cineplex are examples of this, uh, they're most commonly invoked within the interim period prior to closing and with the buyer seeking to exit the transaction. In other words, saying, I no longer have to close either because you haven't operated the target in the ordinary course of business, or I no longer have to close because the target has experienced a material adverse effect. And because of that, another similarity shared by these clauses is that in the case law, there's often an undercurrent of considerations of good faith. In other words, is the buyer in good faith relying on these clauses or is it more of a pretext that, uh, in other words, that the buyer has decided for other reasons that it wants out of the transaction and it's trying to use these clauses as its means of exit. And then Lastly, in terms of similarities, uh, they both suffer from thin Canadian case law relative to Delaware. Uh, similarly, they both have a conflicted relationship uh, with Delaware case law. In other words, uh, Delaware is a different example of how things can go, uh, and that raises questions and also highlights some of the pro problematic issues with the Canadian decisions. And so lastly, and most importantly, the reason to discuss and think about these two clauses together is that Fairstone and Cineplex 
basically both instructed us to do so. In other words, relying on the principle that contracts must be interpreted as a whole, Fairstone and Cineplex said these two clauses, because of this overlap that I discussed earlier and exemplified by the pandemic, will be read by a Canadian court together, uh, at least so far as the Canadian court follows the example of Cineplex and Fairstone. So that takes me to my next slide. <clears throat> So those are the reasons why thinking about these clauses together makes sense. But that said, it's important to realize that they are very different in terms of purpose, function, and structure. Uh, on a smaller note, MAE clauses uh, have been closely watched for a long time now, basically since 2001. Ordinary co uh, course covenants far less so, really since the pandemic. Um, and another difference between the two is that ME clauses are largely hardwired at this point and fully baked in terms of the box that you're playing in when you negotiate them. This is very much less the case with ordinary course covenants in that they afford more room for creative lawyering, for structuring, and for bespoke uh, drafting for the particular target and circumstances. And so when I say they have a different purpose, next slide, please. What am I really talking about? Well, the different purpose is this. Ordinary course covenants are intended to help ensure that the nature of the target business remains substantially the same at closing as it was at signing. In contrast, MAE clauses protect the buyer against the significant deterior deterioration in value of the target business from events occurring during the interim period. In terms of their different function, uh, as I said earlier, ordinary course covenants are very much an affirmative undertaking by the seller. This means that they will guide seller decision making and conduct during the interim period. So ordinary course covenants are very much about choices that the uh, seller makes during the interim period. And because of that, they may require dialogue between the seller and the buyer in connection with the clause including, for example, in connection with the uh, buyer consent. But it makes sense. Things are happening. Seller is about to sell. Buyer might want to talk to the uh, seller about how it is handling those developments. MAE clauses, on the other hand, are a representation of the seller made at signing and repeating at closing. So they're not a covenant but they're very much a risk allocation exercise, something very different th than a covenant. So MAE clauses are about things happening and where they fall in their impact within that risk allocation exercise. So in other words, with an MAE clause, there's no affirmative or interim period obligations on the seller beyond notice. It's just whether or not something happens that triggers the clause. And then in terms of their structure, uh, I noted on this earlier, ordinary course covenants are a contractual undertaking, and they can be very much drafted uh, in a bespoke way for the particular uh, for the particular target, uh, what its business is, the types of things that might arise in the interim period that could require dialogue between uh, buyer and seller. Uh, conversely. Or, you know, in contrast, ME clauses, as I said, are very much a risk allocation exercise. They're heavily negotiated, but but that is somewhat deceiving in, in, in an, uh, to an extent because that negotiation that negotiation happens within a fairly predetermined box of well, are we going to include this or are we not going to include that sort of thing, much less subject to uh, bespoke uh, bespoke drafting. Moving on to my next slide, this is an example of an ordinary course covenant and it's taken from Cineplex and it means actions, uh, ordinary course means actions in the ordinary course of the normal day-to-day -day operations of the business of the company consistent with past practice. Uh, and so to exemplify that in action, a recent decision from the Delaware Court of Chancery is H Control Holdings and Anton Infrastructure Partners. So what we had here 
was a private equity firm buying a group of broadband companies in Florida. During the interim period, uh, it was discovered that a consultant that provided services to one of the affiliates of the broadband companies earlier in uh, their history might actually, or appeared frankly, to have an ownership interest in one of those subsidiaries. In other words, in his service contract, he was not only to be paid uh, in money, but also in um, in an interest in, in that company in the event of, uh, of any one of a series of liquidation events. And so this individual was claiming an ownership interest in one of these subsidiaries that was about to be bought by the private equity firm. Private equity firm didn't like that, obviously. In an attempt to resolve that problem, the seller <clears throat> transferred the assets of that company to another to another affiliate, um, and then dissolved the company that the that the consultant claimed an interest in, and that entity was no longer part of of the transaction. Private equity buyer didn't quite like that, didn't consent to it. And so in the litigation that ensued, which was multifaceted, one of the issues in dispute was, well, was this reorganization and transfer of assets in or outside of the ordinary course of business? The Delaware court actually held that it wasn't. And the reason for that is what I referred to earlier, which, which is the purpose of ordinary course covenants, which is to guard against a fundamental change in the nature of the business. And so the Delaware court essentially held, well, yes, this was a bit unusual, uh, but the assets of this one company still reside with an affiliated company. The company hasn't changed what it's doing. Yes, it's changed its structure, but the essential business is the same and the assets of those businesses are the same and the, the way that those assets are being operated is the same. And so the claim was ultimately unsuccessful, although the buyer was successful on another front and was able to exit that transaction. And so moving on to the next slide, uh, this goes back to my point earlier about the uh, ability for ordinary course covenants to be drafted in a fairly bespoke way. Ordinary course covenants, I showed you an example of what one looks like from the Cineplex dispute. That was a fairly short form uh, of an or ordinary course covenant and was also redacted in a sense because the operation of that clause, when read as a whole and interacting with other provisions, actually includes a series of qualifiers. So ordinary course covenants unlike MEE clauses, can be subject to one or more different qualifiers. These are materiality qualifiers. These are efforts qualifiers, which Vincent talked about uh, in his presentation. In other words, best efforts or commercially reasonable efforts or reasonable efforts. In other words, to give examples of those two qualifiers in practice, the seller would undertake to operate the target in the ordinary course of business in all material respects as, to a, as opposed to a a strictly uh, a completely strict standard or the seller can undertake to operate the target in the ordinary course of business or uh, you know using best efforts or commercially reasonable efforts or reasonable efforts in other words once again not a strict standard both can apply uh, if the parties agree to it and then other qualifiers that are common in ordinary course covenants uh, include consistent with past practice qualifiers. In other words, shrinking what is ordinary business of the target to just how it's operated in the past, except as otherwise provided in this agreement qualifiers, acknowledging that the M&A agreement may actually require in some instances the seller to do something which is outside of the ordinary course. Or the, the seller can be excused from operating in the ordinary course with the buyer's consent. And one of the reasons to highlight these three particular clauses is to acknowledge that these are three points of divergence between Canadian and Delaware case law, and that American commentators, frankly, have been uh, critical of how the Canadian courts have gone on these points. And so to emphasize the point that this is moving on to the next slide, to emphasize the point that ordinary course covenants uh, 
are subject to evolution um, and changes in how they're drafted, you know, what we've seen since the pandemic is such evolution. Um, and so since the pandemic, ordinary course covenants have evolved and grown more complex. Some examples of that are <clears throat> what exactly is consistent with past practice? Does this, for example, include how the target has been operated in circumstances of significant macroeconomic disruption? Uh, very importantly, what is meant with a uh, in compliance uh, with law qualifier in an ordinary course covenant? In other words, the buyer, uh, sorry, the seller is obligated to operate the target in the uh, in the ordinary course in compliance with law. But what exactly is meant by in compliance with law? For example, does that include non governmental, i.e., industry guidelines, which don't quite have the force of law? Or similarly, does that include non-mandatory government recommendations? In other words, not changes in law, but recommendations by government as to how businesses should be uh, operating in instances similar to the pandemic. Uh, and thirdly, uh, buyer consent qualifiers. So I've mentioned the possibility for ordinary course covenants to be subject to the buyer's consent. In other words, the seller can operate outside of the ordinary course provided that the buyer gives its consent to the seller doing so. Uh, so the way that those clauses, previously quite simple, have been further sliced and diced is by providing time limits on the buyer getting back with whether or not it consents, uh, certain issues that are at the buyer's sole discretion um, and not subject to a reasonableness standard. In other words, it's often the case that the buyer has to agree uh, or can only uh, disagree where reasonable to do so. Uh, these changes make it certain things completely at the buyer's discretion as opposed to subject to a reasonableness standard. And uh, a threshold for seeking buyer consent. So I'm cognizant that we're getting close to the end of the hour and I actually haven't had the chance to dive into MAE clauses yet. I'd encourage you to look at the rest of the slides. Uh, I think they speak for themselves to a large extent. What I try and highlight in particular is how, although Fairstone says it's following Delaware law in adapting the MAE clause that it adapts, that's actually only a half truth of, as we've come to realize and as we've dug deeper into the case. In other words, Fairstone diverges from Delaware precedent in three significant ways, which actually have the function of making MAE disputes in Canada uh, somewhat more complicated than they are in the United States. In other words, uh, that's quite remarkable because MAE clauses are, have already been, uh, uh, and MAE disputes are already, are already incredibly complicated, as we've seen from Delaware case law post-2001. Unfortunately, Fairstone muddies the waters, which makes the MAE disputes uh, even murkier and, and less predictable up here. So a very interesting point to see is where other is will be whether provinces other than Ontario uh, follow uh, Fairstone on MAE clauses or whether some provinces, uh, for example, Alberta, which in previous case law has sort of given indications that it might or could see things differently, uh, trend closer to the pure Delaware approach. And so to jump to my last slide, um, what I'll highlight is, uh, what I'll return to is the interaction of ordinary course covenants and a MAE clauses. Uh, so as I said, Fairstone and Cineplex say the two should be interpreted together. They do so based on the principle that contracts should be read as a whole. Makes sense. And that being the case, the MAE clause being more specific uh, in certain circumstances than the, than the ordinary course covenant, what both of those decisions said is, well, I can't interpret the ordinary course covenant in a way that would conflict with the MAE clause because the MAE clause is the more specific of the two. And it read them together. And that's how it's got to its decision on, on the ordinary course point. 
The Delaware Supreme Court, this is noteworthy and goes back to the point of whether or not provinces other than Ontario will follow the, follow the Fairstone and Cineplex standard. So the Delaware Supreme Court, which is the highest court in the state of Delaware, has decided that the two clauses should not be read together. And the reason that it has held that goes back to the points that I focused on earlier, the different structure, the different function, and the different purpose. Basically, the Delaware Supreme Court has said, well, these two clauses serve very different purposes and guard against different risks. And so notwithstanding that there's a principle that an agreement should be read as a whole, in this case, reading those two clauses together would actually confuse and upset those different uh, functions, purpose, and structure. So in other words, the Delaware Supreme Court has basically said that the analysis under those two clauses is analytically distinct to an extent. And so I see that we reached the hour, so I'll, I'll pause, I'll end there, frankly. Uh, thanks everyone for attending. Uh, I don't know if we have time for additional uh, questions. Thank you, Paul. And uh, that concludes our presentation. And, and thank you to our other speakers, uh, Jesse and Vincent as well. And most importantly, uh, thank you to all of you who are joining us today from various parts of the world. Um, and for keeping me employed. And uh, a reminder to please fill out our survey if you haven't already done so. Uh, and if you've missed any of the past webinars, or if you want more information about uh, some of the slides that we maybe didn't have an opportunity to cover today, uh, you can find those at the Faskin Institute section of the Faskin website. And uh, that's right. So I won't take up any more of your time. Thank you, everyone. And uh, we wish you a great rest of your day.